Good morning. Wow. Let's continue, shall we? Yeah. So, so awesome that there is so much confirmation this morning. Where's Mac? There you go. Yeah, the scripture you used. I have that this morning, too. Yeah. Incredible how God just ties that in. But anyhow, this morning, I titled the message today is, There is a Place for You. All right? We all have a place. And uh, you're going to see the theme that's been going on just continue on. Isn't that awesome? So keep resting in his presence. Okay? Just give him permission to keep working in your hearts. So for those of you who may have wondered, what do I have to contribute? You might be asking yourselves, what do I have to give in this place? Where is my fit? Then this message may be of particular interest to you. For those of you who feel that maybe you found your spot, um, it's going to be of particular interest to you as well because you get to make room for others finding their spot and what role that can be as well and more, which I'll get into. But I wanted to say, my goodness, just seeing you looking at me, what a good-looking bunch you all are this morning. Wow, wow. But I just want to say there's a place. We all know that, don't we? But we need to sometimes hear it. There is a place for each and every one of you not only in the family of God, but I'm specifically talking this morning in our family, right? In this church family, in your neighborhoods, in your homes. We're all needed. We're all valued. And as it says here, we all have massively packed stuff from God. Now, Mac, you called it gems, right? And uh, God has given us, every one of us, great stuff. And some of us maybe have not quite... uh, found it or, or feel that maybe that they have, but there's so much more. Because how many of us know, no matter where we are, there is always more in God, right? So liken it like a sports team, which I am the worst one to give a sport analogy. I know nothing about sports. I was going over this in my head last night, and I realized... I was giving some positions of places on a team, and I think I gave three unintentional sports mixed up in one. So I'm going to do, <laughs> I'm going to do my best. I'm going to stick to baseball, right? Stacy, where did you go? Where's Stacy? Somewhere right there. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to stick to baseball, but just like on a team, there is all the various different positions. You've got those who at the moment are up to bat, you've got those who are on the field, you've got those who are on the base, I think I'm doing okay, but you've also got your coach, you've got so many different components to it, I think it might be football, is that where there's offense and defense, I don't know, but we all have our spot, and we're placed there, why, generally speaking, the coach will look and see where their strength or, you know, our strength is <clears throat> and uh, places in it. That's the same as the Father. He put those things in us, as we know, right? And he puts us in a position. So there's a place for you. Now, like a team, I wanted this morning just to pull out several names. I did not ask, you know, because it's all good stuff. I'm going to speak good stuff about a few of you. I have not done everybody. So a disclaimer, don't come to me and say, I'm, you didn't mention me. Just know that you are on the team, you're valued, and you're loved. But I chose specifically people with, you know, doing certain things in this family that have a place that maybe we haven't picked up on, noticed, or put a lot of attention to. So here's just a few. So Pat, if you notice Pat, my eyes were opened like wide to how well she can welcome somebody. (laughs) I'm thinking, I don't have it to that extent. Like, it's incredible. She will make sure people are so um, quickly um, joined in with information, have contacts and various things. And it's like, and of course you do other things. All these people will do other things as well. But I want to call that out in you. That is a absolute treasure that there's a place for you. And there's a place for us all. Bernadette. With the coffee bar, 
You have incredible organizational skills, right? Amazing. But you have this ability to connect to those who are around you. And you see the importance, what other people may just see as coffee, okay? And, and the same could be said about Judy, you know, organizing and structuring the snacks. But you have this ability to understand that it is more than just serving coffee. When we have the ability to serve and others take that time with their friends and our family here, we get into deeper conversations. We check in how we really are doing. So awesome. Thank you for taking a place. We've got Jim and Mish. I don't know where you are all sitting. I'm just going to keep looking like this and it'll look like I'm looking at you at some point. Yes. But anyhow, we've got Jim and Mish who love the import, or love communion and know the importance of communion. And so how do they do that? They, they take their place. They take a place and serve in that. We've got Alex. Alex loves people, right? And he makes these directories so people can contact people. And on beyond that, Debbie and Alex have this amazing ability to call people up. It's incredible to make people feel valued, connected, and part of the team. I know that in, with us, there's been some amazing cards just slip in the mail at the most amazing times. And I know they've done that with a number of people as well here. So thank you for taking a spot. We've got Stacy, who is good at stepping up. She does, there's lots of people do lots of roles. But there you are. Yeah, I remembered. <laughs> But she's great. Stacy. you're great for stepping up. Whatever needs to be done, you're great at putting things together, organizing, calling people together, and running with it. And it's just like, man, I see this. And there was Barb. Where, there you are. So Barb, I will read it word for word so you know I'm not just making this up, okay? Who plays the keys after practice when she doesn't have to, right? And it's to usher in the continuation in between practice and the actual time of um, singing worship to the Lord to continue the ushering of the presence of the Lord. And yet, there you were again. So thank you for taking a spot, your spot. And the last, two quick ones. Norman, you again, do lots of things. But in particular, I don't know if how many people know this. He is talking about a team in the sports, the water boy. Yes, he supplies Bernadette with all the water she could ever need to make sure all of us have that coffee, and it continues, right? And it's these small things that you've got a place. And Sheldon, and the last one I'm going to mention is you. You know, the grass doesn't cut itself, and our garbage doesn't just go whoosh, you know, and take in itself. And so it's incredible that you take your place. It's appreciated. And so the whole point of all this, you might think, well, these are smaller things. That's the whole point. It's the smaller things built together that totally are transform, you know, transforming, transformational. So thank you for the few that I just pulled out. I could go around to the table, I think, and point out everything, but uh, that's not what you come for. So we all carry something that we can contribute. Why? Because we all have Jesus in us, right? It's that fruit in us. And so for those who feel that there's a barrier to that, let me tell you, it might not be what you think. So some of us might feel that, well, I can't do that. I'm too young. I can't contribute to the way that, you know, I would like to because I'm too young. Well, may I say that you're in your prime. I remember my younger years and I had a lot more energy and enthusiasm then. And we need that. How many of us know we need that level of high energy enthusiasm? Ask the guys. You know, where was Chris? Where has he gone to? Right back there. We, they needed his younger enthusiasm and strength when it was taking out that tree roots, right? <laughs> Tarzan. That I couldn't remember what was called. Tarzan. Good job, good job. And so to be young, you're never too young. And that even goes, of course, for children. We've taught that to our kids for years. For those who maybe believe, oh, I'm retired and, and I'm getting too old, good news for you. You don't have the demands of family to the extent that you once did. 
and you're in a position with all this experience in your life, I think you're at the prime. There's this thing called the golden years that the, you know, uh, we use, and, and that's just, yeah, what golden years is what I'm hearing, right? But God's golden years are the best years. Right, Marilyn? That's right. So best years are right where you are as, you know, as being in the retirement and so on. You've got lots of experience to pass on, and we need that. And those who maybe are not the healthiest, there's still things you can do. I think of, you know, Alex, and, and he went through, oh, my goodness, it, it just, honestly, it crushed me many times to see how much he went through that particular year. But his hip and his knee, and he couldn't be here the same as he wanted. But what did he do? He still connected with people. He still connected. He still, out of that place, had something to give and was thinking of others. He took a place. So we can do the same. And those who have children, man, that's a hard job, isn't it? I'm going to talk about that in a bit as well, you know, towards the end. But, uh, you know, um, first having children for me, it's like, well, what can I do? You know, you feel like you're slowed down. And then I had this revelation part way through. It's like, God knew I had kids, and, and you know, and, and so whatever he's called for me, that's got to be part of it somehow. But that's an awesome opportunity, as I'm going to give an example in a moment, because we have the greatest, greatest task to be able to not just teach in word for our children, but to have a demonstration, to demonstrate for them, to model after. Those are incredible gifts of years. And so I want to, I did get permission from uh, Aaron, and last week, to be able to share this, but last week we had this beautiful um, caramel popcorn that Judy had made, and I won't get into the whole entire story for time's sake, but it was a teaching that Luke and Aaron do to teach their children that they have a certain amount, you know, through an allowance, you have a certain amount to give, you have a certain amount to save, and you have a certain amount to keep for yourself. Well, it just, it messed with my heart last week when I heard this, that here's little Jackson, and I I hear that he wanted so desperately to give from that giving fund. We would call it tithes and offerings, right? I imagine it's the same idea. But he wanted to give that to Mac and Judy. It was his desire. It was all on his own. That doesn't come on their own. That comes from teaching and modeling, right? And so what an awesome spot. So then from that, Judy used that and uh, further, you know, put a, a teaching and a demonstration to help him by making this popcorn and handing it out to the, to the congregation. Don't we have an awesome family? Don't we really have such a great family? There is so many of you taking your spots and have taken them for some time. And... There is, last week in particular, I was so amazed just hearing some stories of other people that haven't maybe done so yet, but came forward with their ideas and some plans and some, you know, information to pass on. And it's just like, oh, I, I'm in love with this. I tell you, it's just awesome. Awesome. So, you know, the interesting thing is when we first started coming to City Gate at the beginning, right? And I was wondering, where's my spot? You know, we all kind of wonder, where's our spot? And then all of a sudden, Michael found his spot, and I thought, that's okay, I'm going to be finding my spot soon. And then, I think it was Alexandra found her spot, and I was like, oh, okay, the months are going by. I'm going to be finding my spot soon. And then, still nothing. I still couldn't figure out where I quite fit. Not that I didn't do things, but where did I fit? And then Rebecca found her spot, and it's like, am I going to find my spot? <laughs> We're getting on to a year. And then Preston, he's so, you know, interested and so keen to m- mingle with people and volunteering with greeting and, and various things. And it's like, he found his spot. Am I ever going to find my spot? And, uh, but anyhow, the whole point is that we just keep going in the sense of God, here I am. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to make myself surrendered and open to you. And somehow, I don't know, but if, I don't know what you think, but I think I found a spot. So God found a spot for us all. He has spots for us all. 
I am so dry this morning, and I'd like to connect that, that we are so hungry for the Lord. We are so to thirst after him. And yes, that's also Mac in the end of my message. <laughs> God's so good. So anyhow, we all have a spot. Now, those of us who may feel that we're in our spot, or as Mac, you, you know, Mac calls it our sweet spot, praise God, that's great. But I want to remind us of Ecclesiastes 3, that there's a season for everything, which really is amazing. Pam, the word that you brought up this morning, you know, for those of us, there is more. God is stretching us to the more. So those of us who feel like we're in our spot, it, that gifting, those talents, you know, those desires will, could be stretched and almost like morphed into a different way of serving or, you know, just walking in different things. So we should never get too comfortable because there's always more. We're always being stretched, just like we heard Stacy this morning being stretched. Now, what I want to get to, what is the true barrier? If our age and stage in life is not really a true barrier for being planted where God has put us, then what is the true barrier? So it's about putting you know, off the things that entrap us. So Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. So I'm just going to start. So throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, renew your thoughts and attitudes, put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So walking in the old man, right, the old way, is actually the barrier. So don't slip back into the old ways of the old man. So 1 Peter 1, 14. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back to your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. And if I can add personally to the family, but we sure are knowing now, aren't we? We're knowing more than what we did before. So how awesome is that? How awesome. So the barrier is, one of them is slipping back into our old way of thinking, our old way of acting right? Our old way of doing things. So keep growing. Don't stop growing. Now, here's something I'm going to say. Our spiritual growth is 100% our responsibility. Before somebody throws an axe at me, let me explain, okay? So hang tight. But it is 100% our responsibility. God gives us, you know, he gives us teachers, he gives us spiritual mothers and fathers, there's pastors, there's, you know, so many things, right? He gives us so many things, and he gives of himself the ultimate teacher and guide. And that's great, and it's up to us, if we have that available to us, to access that. And in a moment, I'm going to use the WAR acronym, or acronym. So start thinking what that might mean, and uh, we'll go into that. But it is our responsibility to how much we will grow. And I liken it like I was sharing this story about this week and how often our relationships with the Lord go. When I first, and I'll put it to myself, but when I first came to the Lord and started my journey, I was driving the vehicle, and Jesus was in the back seat. And I would get lost, and I would get frustrated. I didn't know what turn to do and where to go. But as long as he's in the back seat, you know, that's, that's going to be kind of fumbling your way along, doing things on my own, my own way. And then, you know, the growing process happens, and I invite him. I, I realize the importance now. I've got it right now. I've got it completely. I've got the right way. So I invite him to the passenger seat. So I thought it was the right way. And although I am getting better instructions and directions to get to where, you know, he wants me to go, I still get fumbled up. 
But as we grow, isn't it this way, that as we grow and we really learn the art of surrender, then we get ourselves out of that front seat. We then ride shotgun, and we give that room to the Lord. And it's just like that with our growing. It's how much are we going to choose to be involved with our spiritual growth? In other words, how much are we going to truly desire? How much are we going to want that? So let's talk about the war acronym. There is a war for our spiritual growth, isn't there? A lot of things pulling us in different directions. I actually think you should make a card up or something like that. Like, it's, it's that smart. Like, it really is good. Yeah, yeah. So the W stands for what? Want it. That's right. So we got to want it. I think Mac was talking a bit about that too. How much of the Lord do we want to be evident in our lives, directing us to live in that surrendered place where he leads us, he guides us without us, you know, bucking back, right? How much do we want to move forward? And then the second one, the A, is what? Align, right? You are doing good. You must be proud of them. We'll see if they get the third one, because I failed that not too long ago. But I made up for it. But yes, align. So we need to align ourselves. So if we're serious about growing, and again, it doesn't matter about our age or stage of life, as long as we have breath, there is more. Okay? We all have something to contribute, and God has much to still give us no matter where we're at. Okay? And so align. Can you, let's put it this way. When we're serious and we want growth, can you put yourselves in a position of looking around? In this house, we're so, so, so blessed that there is numeral, you know, spiritual mothers, spiritual fathers, mature, you know, people walking in the Lord. We have teachers, right? We have people to walk and, and to lead us in the word. And so align. God has brought it in this season take hold of it. If we're really serious, take a hold of it while we still have the time called today, right? It's coming from Ecclesiastes 3. So we want that. Now, when we get to align ourselves, I want us to be realistic. I want us to remember whose responsibility is it for your growth, Oh, phew, I was starting to sweat there. That took a little bit. I I was ready to go back to page one. (laughs) That's right. It's 100% ours, right? But we need to, uh, you know, to take hold of what God's given us. So I want realistic expectations from us. Is it up to those spiritual mothers and fathers and pastors and teachers and who every, the whole assortment, is it up to them to have you grow No. What the responsibility is for them is to do everything to where they're at, to give what they have for that stage that they're at. They're responsible to God, right? And I'm sure quite aware of it. But it's up to the person coming, you know, whether to the Lord or to them, to take responsibility, which we're getting there, but it's up to them to come and to draw it, right? So I can't make anybody grow, Peggy, you probably can't make anybody grow, but when you're raising your kids, you taught them. You gave them the way to go and the way to grow, and from that, that's the way what they took with it is what they went, right? And so it's just like that. So we're human. We're human. We're all human. Tell your neighbor, I'm glad you're human. And you're thinking, where the heck is she going with that? I should leave it at that and leave you wondering. (laughs) No. So we're human. And I had this conversation, I think it was three times actually this week. So it's like God wants to bring this point out, is we're on a journey. We just have to be willing. We don't have to be perfect. It takes the pressure off. 
for those who are growing, for those who are walking, for finding, you know, walking in our place. Isn't it good news? We don't have to be perfect. We have to be surrendered. We have to be willing. It's a good place. Okay. So what's the R? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Jerry, I think now's the time to get, get stickers out, you know, and put them just right, right there on each one. You've done a good job taking the responsibility. In other words, make the steps happen on your end to put that forward. Take responsibility getting into the word, right? Take that responsibility. And I've said this a hundred times, and I'm so proud to say, I'll be probably saying it about a hundred more. But when you're reading the word, just allow it to really come into you. It's not how fast you read. It's literally, I look at it this way, it's literally the mind and the heart of our Father for us, right? So it's a conversation. And just uh, take that responsibility. Take responsibility for aligning yourself. And certainly the first step, the critical step, or we can't do the rest, is take that responsibility to want to grow. Okay. So what if we don't have somebody, you know, maybe those watching may not have access to a spiritual mother or father right now, or those who can help them grow. I've got some great news. Because there actually is a teacher and, and a guide. And I know you know where I'm going with this. And this particular teacher will lead you all into all truth, right? All truth. And he's a person, and his name is Holy Spirit. And he's real. And he's amazing. And as we draw close to him, the more I'm realizing how connected, you know, we are. John 14 Verse 26 it says, But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, some say helper, some um, scriptures say helper, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I've told you. Okay? So I remember when we're getting ready to launch out to buy our first home, we were still young thought we knew it all, didn't know really much, but we went to view this one particular home, and we thought for sure this has got to be it. But it would have taken everything we would have had to make that happen. And I remember us, you know, later that night, you know, discussing it, and all of a sudden, I just knew, you know, the Holy Spirit, he's our teacher, he's our guide. And he spoke and he said, you're not to take that home. In matter of fact, your home will be, and he gave the exact date and the year. Instead of being excited, I was devastated <laughs> because it was too far away. I think it was like two years down the road. And I'm like, okay, so we stopped. We didn't pursue it, okay? It didn't take too many months. It was less than a year later to hear that the new buyers that bought that property, it was nothing but havoc. Like the whole systems, um, it was quite complicated. Why do I share that? Oh, by the way, we did buy that house that I had forgotten about that word for a long time, and it was on that exact date. So the Lord is our teacher through the Holy Spirit and our guide. So if you don't have somebody walking with you, or even if you do, praise God, he's our first and foremost. So what can you do if you're not aligned? And even if you are, it still applies. You seek the Lord. So the scripture in Jeremiah 29, I pulled out verse 13 this morning. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. It's a promise, right? And Mac talked about that. It takes a desire to want. But when we make that step, he promises that we will find him. He's already found us. The next thing to get into God's word in Proverbs 4, 20 and, and the next two verses from that. Honestly, I think this is one of my top 10 
favorite scriptures, okay? It says, my child, pay attention to what I say and listen carefully to my words, the word of God. Don't lose sight of them. Don't forget them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart. Let them become so part of you that that's how you react and you think, okay? For they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. So get into the word so the word gets into you, right? And then ask him anything and all that you need to know from him because he will answer. It is a guarantee. Let's look at James 1, verse 5 and 6. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as the wave of the sea that's blown and tossed by the wind. In other words, Keep focused on God. Don't go back to the old man. So again, the war. You want it. You align. You take responsibility. Okay? So going back, that we all have a place. We know now that age is not a barrier or stages of life is not a barrier, but these are what is the setbacks, is walking in the old ways, the old mindset. Or, and not taking the desire of wanting to have further growth. And uh, the Lord, again, has packed us with so many amazing things. Now let's get on to some different stuff, okay? I want to talk about family. <clears throat> I've always believed for, I, I don't even know how long, but a very long time and very, very strongly that Outside of God, like meaning God is our first, ministering to him is first. And our next place to minister is to our family, okay? It's to our family. I believe that wholeheartedly, and, uh, and that's what we're called to. And I just want to make it known, maybe you haven't thought of these things I'm about to talk about in a whole different perspective today. I'm hoping we get something new. We knew what was before. I'm hoping here's something a little different angle. So ministry, we all are wanting to be into ministry, but we've already been called into ministry. If you're part of a family, if you have a family, if you have a church family, guess what? You're in ministry. You're on active duty, okay? And thank goodness it is. Now, I want to talk about an experience I had yesterday. Talk about what the enemy's doing, and we're going to wrap up with what God is doing. So Preston has a an assignment, a book assignment that he's got to do, a book report. And he's tried all week to go into the library at school. Can't find anything appropriate. It's supposed to be under fantasy. Um, so we're talking fiction. And uh, then he went to the classroom books, nothing. He brought things home, started to read them, realized eh, it's just not going to happen, meaning the content in it, it doesn't align up with the beliefs that we walk in. So Alexandra went, and I think they spent, I don't know how much time, but a good amount of time online looking at the library. Hmm? 45 minutes, anyhow, trying to find a book. It just didn't suit. I'm getting to the whole point, so hang in there. I'm, I'm painting this picture, okay? And so then, that didn't work. They went to the library that morning, thought they finally had a book. I started reading the first chapter. And even the cover and everything seemed finally, it was okay, it's actually shocking that the characters' names were named after male and female genitalia. And uh, I wish it would stop there. And hidden swear words in it spelt differently with people's names and things. And so that book didn't work. So I went to the library. It's like, all right, we've had enough of this. Push up my sleeves. I was there at least an hour with two librarians helping me consistently the whole time. I've been a parent, you know, Michael and I have been a parent for 27 active years, consistent years. 
And so I've seen the shells. We've spent numerous times living at the library, so to speak. And so in those books, you see, I've always seen where they're, you know, magic, where there's witchcraft and things like that. But to the level today, what I've seen, it's so active in the sense that it is right open on the cover, the symbolism and the words on the back about demon worship, about um, human sacrifices, about so many different things. Needless to say, we still haven't got a book. I'm not sure where this is going to go with his book report, but this is some good news coming out of it. So as I was reflecting this, I was shaken, just thinking, how in that many years could there be such an increase? And yet the Lord's preparing, what a wonderful thing, that he's coming back. He's coming back. And I think it's sooner than we think. And the other thing that is such a, mu- a, a beautiful thing is that he gave me even further insight to the power of family. What a beautiful gift when family is operating correctly. The parents, the mom and the dad, are technically the gates over that child, right? And so when we are doing our best to make sure that we raise them in the way we've given the, you know, Steinman's an example already, and, and, but when we do our best to raise them in the ways, by the time they're old enough, they won't depart from what they're taught, Right? So why does the enemy go for the younger? Because that's where he's aiming, is to get in there. But we are, you know, parents here. And uh, what a beautiful thing for family. Now, that was just a bonus, because that just happened yesterday. But God is on the move. As much as that shook me yesterday, it is even more delightful today, because we know that when the darkness increases, so is his light. Who do you think God's making when we have our spot, when we are desiring to grow, right? When we say, Lord, here is my life, take it, and he will. He will. He will put a boldness in us. He will put, you know, the word so sunk in us with revelation, it will probably knock our socks off. And it will all be empowered by him and his spirit. So we are actually living in some amazing days. Amazing days. But anyhow, let's go on how important it is to have our families, what the Bible says about it. I'm just going to pull up the four and five of this one, Michael. So Timothy, 1 Timothy 3, 4 and 5. First it talks about if you, you know, if somebody feels you know, the desire to be an elder, different languages for, you know, um, various versions, but for if you want to take a position in a church, if somebody aspires to be a leader, okay, um, says lots of different things, as we know, you must have self-control, you must be married and faithful, and so on and so on, but relating to family, verse 4, he must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him, For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? So family is important. Now, you're going to get to learn a lot about what I did wrong with family. So it's going to be good. And you know what? It's part of the process. It's part of the process. And as a result, what I learned from it and, and did well. So there's a great thing you know, we often will think, as rightfully so, that when it comes to family, about what we're teaching our children, and, and as I said, rightfully so, that's, that's absolutely imperative. That's not only obedience, but we're teaching them in the ways of the Lord, and so when they're old, that they will not depart from it. But I'm going to come through a different angle about growing, right? About us parents, about what did God, I believe, set up in the family dynamic that we as parents get to grow out of it, okay? Now, if you don't have a family at home right now, perhaps they've grown, and, you know, maybe you're at the stage of having grandchildren, great, that's awesome. Perhaps you're young and you don't have a family yet, that's okay, because it will still all apply to you completely, because 
Well, let's back up. If some of you are saying, but I didn't get it right with my family. My family's already, you know, they're adults now, or I wasn't a believer back then. You know, all these kind of things that we just can be too harsh on ourselves. That's not my message today. I'm saying we have today, and it's not too late. We still have family. And whether we have parents and cousins and friends, if you don't have a family of your own yet, that's great. That's where we start. And for those who have maybe your children out of the home, you can start there. We have today, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. But raising a family for me, in which I believe, again, I think it's God's intent, is that it helps us grow. Jerry has this saying that ministry, how do you say that, is not... You're not there for the ministry. The ministry is there for you. That gave her time to have a glass or a drink of water. That's right. Good job. Yeah. And so what could be meant by that? And just to make it quite clear, what is God doing when he puts us in ministry position to grow us? Right? And that's my, my part today. So as I said, I learned a lot of things, as we all do, by what not to do, okay? But these are some of the things, just some, not all, and I'm sure you can say the same, what I've learned. This is where I learned endurance. (laughs) Oh, come on. Being married and having a family, it's hard. Very, very hard, and it's demanding, and My goodness, I went from a life where I can make decisions on my own, and now all of a sudden, I've got a husband and almost a child at the same time, months later. We were very, very blessed to have a child so quickly, you know, um, I think it was a year after we were married, and and, uh, so all of a sudden, things changed. And so, you pour in everything you've got, but it was such a hard adjustment. It took years for me to be able to properly put them first, but yet to have the balance, you know, you obviously have to have um, time for yourself, or they will not get the best of me, they'll get the best of the worst of me. That's not pretty. I was waiting for you to smile back there, Michael. (laughs) Yeah, but anyhow, I learned endurance, and boy, did I ever need it, right? The things and the challenges that come, I ever, uh, I ever needed it. And uh, so forgiveness. This is a great spot where I actually learned over years to forgive quickly, to forgive when they don't even ask for, to be forgiven, when they're not even sorry. But it, it was also a great place to learn, to be able to be filled with grace for them, to still love them, knowing that they're going to be hurting me. You can sometimes see, you know, your family make decisions, of course, and you know it's not going to go well for them. And, uh, but it, forgiveness is such a huge key. So I learned forgiveness. I learned to correct in love and not in anger. How did I learn that? By correcting in anger and not love, right? <laughs> oh my goodness. Maybe I should have thought about this. You know, our kids actually do attend this church. They could be given some good testimonies here. <laughs> but what ended up happening Actually, I became broken. I'll be honest. There's two points in my parenting that I still, I will cry if I mention it. So I'm not, I'm not going to get into that too much. Where God totally, I was so broken. I had tried and tried and tried on my own. Boy, I wasn't expecting that. And you've got to get to that place where you have nothing left. There's nothing left in you to give because everything I went to give in that area was not working. And it's in those beautiful places that I first learned how to surrender. And you know, I'm so thankful for the series of events that led to that. Because when you can no longer count on yourself, you're in a great position to finally be moldable for God to work through you. And so very, you know, definitely dying to self as well. How many of us know those babies keep needing fed? They don't care what time of night it is, right? They don't care if you're sick. They don't care if you're happy or if you're grumpy. You know, they have all their needs, of course. And that moves up into when they're toddlers and preschoolers, and it just keeps on going. 
And but it's an excellent way, I believe, that God has, if we embrace it, that we can learn dying to self, where things aren't about us all the time anymore, you know, in our marriage, in our family. I also learned faith to call things out, even though I didn't see them, to call things out as if they already are. I remember, you know, certain, many situations, but one in particular where <clears throat> Rebecca literally didn't speak for her first two years of kindergarten, and she spoke a few words in grade one. And, uh, and she was slow, and she was the sweetest little girl. She really was. But at times she would be moody, and I'm like, Lord, this is, you know, I'm just so, I, I have nothing to offer anymore. I, I don't understand. And that's the first lesson he taught me is to speak things in faith, which I didn't even really understand what that meant then. To speak into her identity as to who she really was, because that wasn't her. And so I would, you know, remember, actually I remember being those in St. Mary's, you know, along the river. But, um, and the Lord speaking to me, I want you to say this about her. And I remember saying very vividly, even out loud, because I thought it was just preposterous. Lord, but I'm lying. You want me to lie? <laughs> and uh, because I wasn't seeing it. And so he walked me through and he led me in scripture and spoke it. And look at my girl today. Like, isn't she amazing? Michael and I are so proud of who she's become and who she continues to become. But you have to speak it in. So we learn faith, right, in our families and wisdom because we're asking a lot, right? We realize as we get further in the journey, we start off so confident. I've got marriage. It's great. We love each other. That's all we need. Leaning on love, I think, is an old country song. That was enough for us, right? And when children come, I'm going to be the great parent. I'm going to be a wonderful mother. And then reality hits. That darn reality, isn't it? Yeah. But that's the whole process. I'm convinced that's the process. To embrace the process and to be willing and want to grow, to look at dynamics of friendships, whether, you know, you may not have a family right at home, as I mentioned, but you've got friendships. You've got, hopefully, parents or you've got people around you. You've got your grandchildren. You've got adult children. And let's just assume if you don't have that ability to practice in those realms, there's one right here, and it's called family, right? But it's from this place where I learned in absolute brokenness that I have a real God, that he's real, okay? And from that, I realized that I'm actually real, what I thought I was going to be is a superhero mom who could do it all and meals on the table and, and uh, gosh, those days were good as short as they were, Michael, when he would get off work and the meal would be so ready, like it was ready to go and, and uh, the kids, you know, would be attentive and I'd be up at the nights and, and it's like, what in the world was I thinking? <laughs> and so I'm glad that it's, you know, parenting Michael, you know, has been very hands-on and to help. Doesn't mean I don't cook. Doesn't mean I don't get up in the night. Matter of fact, I absolutely do. But my point is this. I became a real people, if we want to call it that, realizing that I have limitations. I don't have to be somebody that I'm not. It's not me going to change myself. It's going to be God in me, right? And again, that place of surrender. And patience, and that just goes to be said. We can imagine how many patients we need. And so this is the training ground. Going back to we all have a place. We are all right now in the ministry of family. We all have a place. You have a place outside these walls, and you certainly have a place inside these walls. And it's because of I feel this place, this wonderful ministry called family is where we get to learn. So bring it to, you know, um, another message, you know, and I can thank you, Aaron, for mentioning this one recently. 
I spoke about offense. It's just an opportunity with family to learn. It's a growing opportunity. Think of things as these opportunities, as ministry opportunities, right? We get to grow, whether we're offended or we're not offended, and so on, and, and those particular things. So the real question is, what did you learn from it? What do we learn from day-to-day life? In this case, family. We're all born into a family, praise God. We probably learned that there's a real God. Hey, I have to throw this in there somewhere, so wink, wink. There's a real God. We're real people with real family. And I wanted today to focus, as you know, on the family, that we have a place and its importance. And so once we go through this training ground, then we're in more of a position to then come and be in other ministries that God puts us in, whether we're ministering to our neighbors, whether we're leading a Bible group, or whether we're, (laughs) I was going to say something, I'm good, I'll let that one go, but um, yeah, we have more, we're better equipped, we've learned, hopefully, the beginning of learning to surrender, we've learned patience, doesn't mean we have arrived, okay, does not mean because you've had a family or been born in a family and have these opportunities we've arrived. It means we just start looking at what God has been doing already in your lives. And then we get to continue it on and we have more experience to bring it into where we are today. So did we learn how to be real? Are we learning how to be real yet? We are. Yeah, we are. Yeah, and it's good. So, I just want to say that there's a place for you. There is an absolute place for you. You're filled with goodness, you're filled with treasures, and you're in a safe place to be able to walk in it, to learn where your place is, to be able to grow. And it's also a good place. We have many people here willing to walk alongside you. And that's good for those who are willing to walk alongside because it helps them grow too, to help make room. So if anything, I'm hoping today brought you to the understanding that God's been doing a lot more in your life than what you may have realized. And that he's got a lot more for you than maybe what you realized. And where you thought maybe there were some barriers to continue you know, growing in in what he's calling you to, maybe they're actually gifts. Maybe they're fields of potential experience ready to be gained, where he's stretching, he's growing, he's strengthening us. And so there is a place. You're in a place, there is a place. And I'm so glad, and I know Jerry is, I know we all are glad, that you're here that you're you, and that you bring in each and uniquely what God has in you. So let's pray. Father, I thank you that the first step is wanting you. Father, to love you, to love who you are, to want more of you in our lives, to to be displaying, to flow freely. And so, Father, thank you. Thank you that you've placed people here that by your spirit we can align. You've given us your word. You've given us your spirit. We are honestly, eternally grateful. Father, thank you for aligning us with the opportunities that you give us. You're so gracious. You're so full of love that we can grow even further by aligning ourselves to walk alongside people that can not just agree with our problems but point us to the word to remind us of who we really are in you. Father, I thank you for this house. I thank you for people's heart to to love you and to love one another and to serve. 
I thank you that you called each and every one. That your heart, Father, is to make room for those to have a place that maybe haven't went to that specific place or had a place yet. But for those, Father, that we do have a place, you're stretching us, you're growing us. There's always more. As Pam said so elegantly, Father, you're giving new assignments. So, Father, we give you praise, we give you glory. And as we go this week, would you remind us what family can we pour into? Is it our neighbors? Is it our coworkers, our church families, our natural families? Father, you put us there to not only to bring your kingdom in that situation for strengthening, to serve, but Father, you also place us in those situations to stretch us, to grow us in these assignments. We give you praise. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. There's lots of people.